Good afternoon, everyone, and welcome to today's webinar. I'm pleased to introduce our first webinar of 2022, which will be with Jen Schellendorf presenting on Game Changers at Work, how the LGBT plus community and their allies are changing the global economy. So in a moment, I'm going to pass over to Jen, who's going to do his uh, presentation. But before I do, I'd just like to let everyone know that today's session will be recorded and you will receive a copy of the presentation a week from today. Today's session will also feature some polls, which I'm going to launch in a moment, and they'll be available throughout the session. So we do encourage you to, to um, answer those polls, and obviously Jen will be able to discuss his findings later on during the session. So without further ado, I'm going to pass over to Jen to begin the session. Over to you, Jen. Thank you so much, uh, Paul, and uh, hello, everybody, wherever you are. So um, uh, it's an honor, of course, to um, go on uh, with uh, or start this session. So I have some problems here to go on with the, uh, Paul, can you help yeah. me? Um, I think it might be because I've got the poll open. Uh, let me just close that. You should be able to try again now. No. Uh, if you click your mouse on the, on the presentation, Okay, wonderful. There you go. Perfect. Thank you. So, thank you again for for having me here at uh, at Amber. I'm I'm. It's an honor as well to to open this um, uh, session for this year. And hello, everybody around the world, wherever you are. So, uh, today uh, the title of the the seminar or the webinar is this again: Game Changes at Work: How the LGBT Plus Community and their Allies Are Changing the Global Economy. Uh, I think you have uh, seen a bit about me as uh, the presenter or the author of a book, which is uh, um, uh, the foundation of my presentation today. So the book title, as you see uh, on the right hand side is Game Changers, um, which uh, I think is a nice <laughs> twist as well. Uh, the book has been published uh, last spring. It has been uh, quite an impact so far. Um, I've got uh, a lot of responses. The book was nominated for several awards as well. So uh, a lot of impact. It's the first of its kind globally. But now I start and uh, let me share, for instance, uh, so that's the first slide I'm showing here, uh, what I'm talking about today. Uh, so uh, there are three parts basically. The first part I'm talking about uh, what I call a stunning uh, ec ecosystem, which has been evolved around um, LGBT equality at global workplaces. Then I will be talking about drivers and trends and fields of action. I think that's self-explaining. Uh, and then I'm, I'm, I'm going to number three and not number four, there's a mistake, sorry for that, um, to, uh, to, to take action in the corporate setting and ensure LGBT plus equality um, at uh, work. So that's my next slide here. And this gives you a shared um, sort of um, um, idea uh, about how I worked through my book and how I got to the insights in my book and, and my presentation here. So I've been traveling around uh, the world uh, across four continents, uh, have um, talked to many people, more than 100 um, in the US and Canada and, and all over Europe. Uh, uh, and uh, so for instance, I've been, as well in Seattle, there is this uh, very um, global uh, conference, which is called Workplace Summit of Out and Equal, one of the major um, organizations uh, dealing with LGBT plus equality at work, which is very old, perhaps one of the oldest globally. It started already in the late 90s, and of course now has been uh, very successful, successful, and it's sort of a light tower or leading um, event is this global conference which as you may imagine has been digital only and virtual only in 2020 and 21 because of the pandemic. But I've been there in Seattle, uh, more than 5,000 people and you see some impressions here um, uh, of this uh, research I've done there. And there's a, a, uh, a huge um, numbers of, of uh, has been a huge numbers as well of sponsors, which of course sees, it gives you an impression how many companies are already engaged in this topic, at least in the US. Although of course the Workplace Summit is global, it has a certain, um, um, uh, of course, um, US um, bias to some extent. 
Uh, this conference was very special as well because um, I mean it's it's. Uh, it's four days, five days overall, you have a lot of seminars, workplace, work, uh, 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 workshops, you have keynotes, of course. But this was the first event when we saw as well a lot of Indians showing up, uh, because you may know, or perhaps may not know, uh, in that um, September of the year 2018, um, uh, India changed its laws and decriminalized um, uh, 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 same sex uh, uh, in the law, which was an old colonial law and opened up possibilities as well for, for companies, but also for, for foundations that are openly to address the topic of LGBT plus equality. And since India is such a large uh, uh, country, of course, this has an, a global impact as well. So i uh, give you another example um, for uh, uh, to, uh, to, 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 to tell you something about this. Well, the European setting, there is, of course, other organizations like Stonewall in the UK, uh, which is as well very old. There is uh, Workplace Pride, which is uh, a major organization and uh, in, uh, which is based in, in the Netherlands, uh, where uh, more than 70 organizations as members, Stonewalls has even more, and of course, um, uh, out in Euclid, even more because of the US uh, and engagements there as well, either the uh, Latin America and in China. Workplace Pride is very special in that sense because, you know, the Netherlands, of course, compared to, to, to the United uh, um, Kingdom or, for instance, the US, is smaller. It's about 18 million uh, um, inhabitants. But there's a lot of activities, even the workplace pride web page is only in English. The government is very active there. So there are several ministries, members of workplace pride working for LGBT equality at the workplace, uh, not just in, um, in the Netherlands, but far beyond. An example for this, of course, uh, is uh, a series of conferences that have been undertaken uh, uh, since they've been set up uh, 2000, uh, uh, so some 10 years ago, approximately. Uh, so there was as well uh, an event, for instance, they did together with the community business in Hong Kong. So I've been traveling uh, to, to Hong Kong to attend this event. Also, it was in Amsterdam, as I was saying, with Workplace Pride and in Seattle with and Equal. So uh, talk there. And of course, um, community business is special uh, because, you know, Hong Kong is special. Uh, it belongs to mainland China. Uh, and at that time, when I was there, there was a lot of activities led by community business. And there was the cooperation between um, Workplace Pride um, Foundation in the Netherlands, Accenture, where the event was hosted, and community business, community business, not just engaged in DNI matters um, in Hong Kong, but also in other parts of the region, for instance, in the Philippines and so forth, and India as well. So, um, but of course, just in brackets, um, since about two years, of course, the situation in Hong Kong has a bit changed, but still, there are many companies engaged um, in workplace um, uh, equality, LGBT workplace equality in Hong Kong. I've been also traveling to uh, uh, to, to Africa uh, to uh, uh, to Johannesburg specifically uh, to see their uh, launching uh, the first um, um, LGBT plus equality index. Uh, and this gives you as well an indication uh, what is going on around the world, especially uh, during the last, let's say, seven to eight years. There was a kind of a momentum, which I'm describing in my book as well at length. At length. So it started around 2013 and 14. Many organizations, so what I call the LGBT ecosystem around the world, a sort of mushroomed from that time approximately on. And also, um, so South Africa was then um, showing up in that respect and um, was setting up a major business conference, the first of its, on the continent of its kind. Um, and um, there was then an event, uh, so uh, with workshops and discussion, but also they launched, as I said, um, uh, uh, the first um, uh, equality index, LGBT plus equality index for, for the corporate world, which of course was a major thing and has a, a strong impact as well and, and signaling in fact to, to the whole continent. So I'm going on. 
So this is also a major uh, organization I wanted to briefly introduce to you, which is open for business, uh, which has been set up also only uh, 2015. So because I was talking about uh, this sort of strong development uh, starting is basically in 2013 and 14. Uh, with um, many, many organization, in, uh, organization have been set up uh, globally, as I was saying, in South Africa. And also Open for Business 2015 is one of these organizations. And what they are focusing at, they're also um, uh, they are focusing to, um, on researching basically the business case of LGBT plus equality and the economic case of LGBT plus equality. And um, uh, of course, you, you know the difference of the, the two. So the business case is focusing more on um, the economic impact uh, with respect to workplaces, mainly the business world, while the economic case of LGBT plus equality focuses on the uh, impact on the whole economy. And of course, this is interlinked, that's clear. Uh, and uh, so they've started to uh, do research. I'm getting back to this point a bit later. And I've been invited for a major thing they did in, in Brussels in 2018 when they were um, presenting a major study here uh, on the role of the private sector in advancing LGBT across LGBT inclusion. But meanwhile, they have uh, launched many other uh, 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 research um, studies and uh, and for open business, it's a bit the same uh, as for, for other organizations I've just mentioned. Um, so, but perhaps even more for, for open for business relevant that they have a global appeal. They are based in the UK. They are run from the UK, but they have a now as far as a director in Kenya. They have a very strong hold in the US as well. The member companies that, that are giving money, when you're going to their website open for business, I can recommend this to you. You see a lot of major companies from the consulting industry, such as BCG, uh, McKinsey, Accenture, but there's also IBM um, um, uh, and, and, and Virgin, for instance. So many, 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 many. Um, uh, you, you will see this on the website, as I was saying. And um, so they're doing research, but they also, do some things like uh, rating uh, cities globally um, on their being LGBT friendly or not. And usually they are launching then every year a, um, an index showing which city is the most friendly according to their criteria. And uh, the last time it was Amsterdam who uh, was the winner. And there is, as you may know as well, uh, in the city world, a now a kind of a competition as well, who is then perceived as the most LGBT friendly um, uh, 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 city, because this has become a very um, attractive factor as well for marketing the city, for attracting people to come there and during the pride season, but not just only during the pride season. So, uh, and also this is not just limited to uh, the corporate world as such, this has also reached Another level uh, around, I was talking about uh, the, the year 2013 and 14, so because I'm describing a development, a very strong development, because in 2013, uh, and this is very much connected to the Obama administration, mainly Hillary Clinton, who pushed, pushed this sort of change within the United Nations um, system. They launched a, an, a campaign, which is called the Free and Equal Campaign, uh, which, um, has the goal, and still running, um, a goal to, um, to teach people around the world uh, and to address um, um, uh, discrimination issues around LGBT equality. And um, also I can recommend to you for those who are interested to either reach out to me or to go to, to, the, uh, to, to the website and to get some more information about that. What is very important here, and that's the reason why I put in this chart here, uh, you see um, um, they have now as well launched what is called um, the United Nations LGBTI Standards of Conduct for Businesses. And that's very new, uh, it's very recent, it was launched in 2017, inspired by the Free and Equal Campaign, and it's still run under the roof of the Free and Equal Campaign. Uh, and that allows companies to sign and to commit publicly 
um, as uh, a, a LGBT friendly, and it's not just uh, um, something which uh, sort of limits the company to 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 address LGBT equality in their company as such, but also go beyond. Uh, so uh, address, uh, for instance, um, the issue of LGBT friendliness. Uh, in the customers' world, in the supply in their supply chain, um, and uh, the investors' world, etc., and also to encourage them to stand up for human rights, and uh, that's uh, that's a major thing which uh, which uh, happened in 2017, and uh, a lot more than 300 um, corporate uh, corporates has signed these standards. A lot more approaching 400 now and um, so that's of course something as i said starting 2013 a free and equal campaign then these standards which have this connection to uh, the corporate world a major achievement although of course it's um a sort of a self um, obligation they are doing there i'm going on uh, to show you another major major thing uh, and you know uh, the world economic forum is like uh uh, the high mass of the global elite, you know, there's a discussion around the World Economic Forum, whether or not they should have this important role they're playing now. Of course, they have been limited in impact because of uh, COVID, because they uh, also uh, were uh, forced to do their events um, um, digitally, virtually. But uh, this is where the global meters, uh, leaders are meeting. And until 2013, there was nothing, 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 nothing. Um, uh, so there was attempts to bring this topic of LGBT plus equality on the agenda in Davos, but there was no, uh, no uh, 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 sort of successful attempt. Um, but it was in 2014 when a major investor, Paul Singer, uh, uh, teamed with another investor and said, we have to change this. So Paul Singer has a gay son. Um, and he said, uh, so we have to change this and make this topic in the World Economic Forum because uh, it's about here, um, uh, uh, it's about representation, it's about rights, and it's about, of course, resources. So it makes, again, the connection to um, the business case and the economic case uh, of LGBT equality. But of course, he also I wanted to address this because of a human rights issue. And that's interesting because uh, it, uh, as you may recall, uh, after the world economic, uh, world, after the world crisis, world financial crisis 2008 and 2009, there was a change in perception of the global capitalist system. Uh, demanding more um, more ethical goals to address by by corporates, etc. Uh, uh, morality, ethics played a role. Business schools as well have changed their agenda uh, and included ethical topics in their uh, in their mm -hmm. curriculum, etc., etc. So, and the World Economic Forum, uh, since this is sort of the major platform for global leaders, took this up. Uh, 2014, in the beginning, involuntarily, because uh, as you may know, uh, the global corporates are paying a, a fortune of money to be member of the World Economic Forum and the first leagues, and they, but they have as well the freedom to do some side events. And, uh, and of course, uh, when you're one of the most uh, prestigious uh, world investors like Paul Singer and Daniel Loeb, so his uh, teammate uh, sort of in setting up this event together with Microsoft uh, and others. Uh, um, so, of course, when they are saying we are doing this event, other people was, were coming from major corporates like Accenture, the Deutsche Bank, um, MasterCard, et cetera, et cetera. And this changed the conversation in Davos and um, made a very, very strong uh, uh, impact as well in changing the ag agenda. So the year after, um, there was then the first kind of uh, official event where the, the topic of LGBT equality was then addressed. And there was a sort of a mushrooming uh, thing of uh, people um, showing up for this, uh, these topics, setting up uh, um, events where, which had a connection as well to natural sciences, to uh, as well the trans issue was what then brought up on the agenda, et cetera, et cetera. So this is uh, of course reflects kind of 
a, 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 a dramatic, the dramatic change we have seen so far in the corporate world addressing the topic of LGBT plus equality. So excuse me, I was too fast. So, um, so this is the next one here. Um, so uh, just to summarize where we are, I've described a bit uh, the evolving and fast growing ecosystem uh, in the world around LGBT plus equality, which uh, was fed by the UN, which was uh, sort of um, also supported by the World Economic Forum, where you have, we have seen a stunning new, um, a stunning number of new organization um, being found, for instance, like the one in South Africa I've mentioned, Open for, Open for Business I've mentioned, so Proud at Work Foundation in Germany, for instance, or another one is Ready in Spain, and uh, East Meets West, which covers a bit Central and Eastern Europe. So that's uh, all pretty new. Uh, and of course, that's a major thing. I think I would if I could just briefly go back to this one here. What is interesting here that the World Economic Forum has now, um, um, so since 2019 now, there is now the partnership of global LGBT uh, I equality, which is a, a part of the World Economic uh, Forum system, has now started to, um, uh, uh, to manage uh, the standards I've, I've said here. So you know, we see a sort of a cooperation a kind of merging of the World Economic Forum issues with the United Nations for on the topic of LGBT equality globally from a human rights perspective, but also from a business perspective. Of course, that's a major uh, major development uh, which um, uh, which we we we, uh, we have seen there. So uh, let me go now to the next point, which is drivers, trends, fields of actions. Um, there's a long list and uh, be uh, relaxed. Uh, I don't want to, to address all these uh, 10 topics. Um, uh, they are very strong drivers. Uh, one I've addressed already, which is, which is the ecosystem uh, fed by um, many uh, players. But let me perhaps uh, say one thing, which are very, very crucial, I think, for, for current developments. One is that uh, uh, while, let's say, uh, some 10 years ago, uh, there was sort of a resistance, a resistance of businesses to even uh, address the topic of human rights, this now has changed. Of course, there are many corporates uh, who, uh, uh, only claim to be interested to take care of human rights, but there is an increasing number and an increasing pressure uh, for, for them to take care of these. And of course, this is connected very much to this idea of corporate social responsibility. I'm, 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 I'm sure that all of you have uh, known this topic already. Uh, so there is this CSR topic, uh, responsible business uh, I've put in here where sort of the business world is connected to the, the, the human rights world in some way, where the topic is then uh, sort of matched with the LGBT equality topic. And of course, this is very much connected to this question of social change. Um, so uh, this is one major driver we see. So CSR, uh, this is a sort of uh, the roof and there is, the business interests, the social change uh, topic, and the LGBT equality and human rights topic. And that's new. This was not there, let's say, seven or eight years ago. Then we see, and that's very, very impress impressive as well, we see uh, a, um, um, a, a very fast uh, sort of landscape, fast growing landscape around role models, knowledge, facts, uh, indexes measuring discusses and stories. So my book, for instance, but it's not just my book, as you go into the internet, you see that there is a growing awareness for how important it is to have role models. And there are a lot of uh, organizations now, many of them I've addressed um, uh, just recently in this, uh, so a couple of minutes ago in this ecosystem, they have programs in which they feature role models. So for instance, on the exec role models, so LGBT plus uh, role models on the executive level. Um, so uh, LGBT plus uh, um, uh, uh, role models on uh, in, in, the, in the cohort of the young. Mm. 
so also um, what is important as well, they are, have increasingly as well uh, featuring role models and the allies sections. It's not because the, some years ago, people have come to understand that it's not enough to address in their LGBT plus um, equality politics and policies around DNI and HR and so forth to focus on the LGBT community as such only, but to sort of get into a discussion and broaden the, the focus and get allies into this. So fathers, mothers, those who have friends that are LGBT plus who are nevertheless interested, um, who, who are interested in, in questions around uh, justice, equality in general. And of course this cohort has grown dramatically. And this is of course one very important thing around the model thing. Knowledge and facts, we still, this I have to, to, to say, we still um, have a, a, a shortage in, in facts and figures, but this is at least gradually changing because there's now more money from the corporate world going into these organizations I've just described. Uh, we as now as, as well now see at universities, but not just that the um, uh, so more research out describing, for instance, how many people are there, how many people are there in a society that self identify as gay, lesbian, uh, uh, bisexual, um, trans, um, intersexual, queer, asexual, etc. So, uh, and of course you may imagine that of course the cultural setting um, is important for getting these information because um, for instance, in, in some liberal Western countries in Europe, we have a very high sensitivity around privacy and to share these data while in other countries it's more easier to collect data on, on these topics. So in the Anglo-Saxon countries, um, it's usually easier to get these uh, facts. And for instance, there's the Williams Institute in the US, which is focusing very much on collecting uh, data, 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 data to have a basis as well to understand uh, what, uh, how large uh, is the, um, the community of LGBT people? What are their needs? What are their shortcomings? Where are the successes as well? And this is, only in the beginning, but this has uh, sort of um, mushroomed as well in awareness, but also uh, the research findings are, are richer, are becoming richer. So there's a growing as well amount of indexes measuring LGBT equality at work, so in global places. So for instance, Stonewall from Britain has an index for uh, the United Kingdom, but also for the global world. There is the Human Rights um, uh, the uh, uh, Human Rights Foundation in um, Human Rights Campaign, excuse me, in the U.S. Uh, based in Washington, mm -hmm. who's uh, dealing with this topic. It's, that's perhaps one of the most important indexes, which are rating companies uh, on whether they are LGBT friendly and to what extent they are. Uh, there is, uh, for instance, as well, uh, these indexes now in uh, in uh, in Germany. There, uh, there are indexes as well in other countries. So that's, um, I, I've mentioned the one in South Africa. Uh, there is a major one, very highly sophisticated one in the Netherlands. There is the one as well in, in Italy uh, where you have an organization uh, uh, which is called Parks. So, uh, so this, all the things around models, knowledge, facts, indexes, measuring to get an insight on, on what is really out there uh, in terms of LGBT equality specifically um, has grown uh, during the last years uh, dramatically. And this of course is very much connected as well that you see um, in the social media, but not just there And my story as well addressing this topic stories. And of course we all know that um, so just having data is not enough. You have to have a narrative and to tell story and these stories are then connected to facts and to models, role models. And this is also growing and um, I'm uh, going on to the next slide. Uh, I think that's another one I wanted to briefly uh, look at because I want to as well um, raise your awareness for this that we are now talking increasingly about not uh, about sh shareholder value capitalism, but mostly there is now a strong tendency as well to talk about stakeholder capitalism. Um, so what does this mean? Uh, so it does mean that, and of course that's relevant for, for this topic here I'm talking about, what does this mean? It does mean 
that uh, until let's say some 10 years ago, approximately until the financial crisis, um, there was a strong focus of business uh, to, um, to address most of their uh, uh, attention to increasing profits and uh, shareholder profits. So shareholder uh, uh, gains and, and profits. So um, of course that's uh, understandable from a historic point of view because there was a strong influence by uh, thinkers like Milton Friedman. some of you may know, the, know him and others. Uh, but this has changed because the skepticism around um, um, uh, 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 sort of the responsibilities uh, of, of companies um, has grown after the financial crisis because uh, especially the financial players, but also other companies uh, which have been bought out uh, by company by governments because they had problems and then were um, too big to fail and then tax, tax may, tax, taxpayers' money had to get into this gap and was filled to save these uh, companies, including banks, of course. You may, some of you may recall this or know this. There was a changing discourse around what the, what the, when we are talking about responsibility. And I had this topic already around responsibility, but in a more broader sense, it's really, uh, something which is as well uh, loading the whole development around LGBT equality is that companies are not just responsible for those who are giving the monies, so the investors, so the uh, shareholders, but it's uh, about uh, as well for that they are responsible whether vis-a-vis -vis their employees, the customers, the suppliers, the whole value chain, the media, the, so they have to, to take that have to take the um, interest of all these um, partners into their um, consideration and, and their uh, function, if you want. Also, uh, that's interesting because they also has a growing uh, tendency as well to work together with NGOs and civil society organizations uh, and to engage even with opponents. Uh, and you see very strongly this movement uh, towards stakeholder capitalism, because uh, in, in the connection of uh, talking about uh, 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 pushing forward sustainability in the corporate world. So this is definitely something uh, which is also as a, as a movement pushing for more LGBT equality around the world. So um, uh, let me stop here for a second. Um, so Paul, uh, would you like to um, share the results? Okay, yeah, so we see the results um, of the questions, uh, the polls. Uh, so let me just briefly go into this before I, I'm, I'm coming to the last uh, final part mm -hmm. of my presentation. So, um, so do you know the LGBTI standards of contact for business? So yes, said only 4% and no said 96%. So I'm happy that you learned a bit about the LGBTI United Nations standards of conduct for business. Uh, that's a major thing I said. Um, so I really recommend uh, to you uh, to go to, to the PGLE website. We see more information or reach out to me because that's a major thing which drives the movement around LGBT equality. Uh, there is another question I've asked. Uh, so how many people in, in A or any society do you think belong to the LGBT plus community? So um, about 2.5% uh, of you, the audience said 13%. Uh, about 7.5%, uh, 50% say was saying this. And about 20% belong to the LG plus community was saying 38%. That's interesting because um, uh, many people don't know at all. Some people have a rule of thumb say between five and 10, which would then meet, match approximately the 7.5%. Uh, and in fact, that's what, uh, there is no sort of, uh, real data about this uh, out, but there's some metadata and across all over the world gave a sort of an approximation, at least until recently, that's about 70.5% uh, in any society. Some say five, some say six, uh, some say eight, so it's about 75%. So the 50% will make this point here um, 
are, are not far from reality in that, that sense. But what I want to make, uh, I want to make a point here is that there are now recent studies which show that um, um, through the rise of the sensitivity around non-binary identities, for instance, or intersexual uh, people, or people who self-identify as queer, whatever then this means uh, specifically, or as asexual, or as pansexual, or as omnisexual, um, that there has been a dramatic change uh, across the generation. So the younger generations, I assume, most of you in this, um, in this webinar are below, let's say, 25 or below 30. And of your generation, is a lot more into uh, belonging to or self-identifying to a, an organization, uh, to to, to self-identifying to a, a, a sexual orientation or gender identity, which is not the majority. So the majority is heterosexuality, uh, means sexual orientation, um, heterosexual, uh, and uh, belonging to um, what is called cisgender. So, uh, but there are, there's now research out as well with respect to the yes, for instance, which says about 20% uh, of the younger ones self-identify as not belonging to the uh, mainstream uh, sexual orientation or gender identity, which of course is a lot. And what this research also shows that there is a strong change. Uh, so. So the younger generation have this tendency, at least in the US, and there are similar movements in other, at least liberal Western countries, uh, and also in other countries, uh, but this is less so uh, the older the people are. So let's say those who are 40 plus, there is, you're coming closer to the 70.5%. Uh, and if you're getting to the 60 or 70 people, 70 year old people, there's even less. So the younger the people, uh, the more they self-identify uh, to uh, as sort of not belonging to the heterosexual ma majority or to the majority of uh, gender identities. So that's a very interesting um, uh, uh, development. You may not be surprised, and many of you may not be surprised if you go as well along uh, what you see in the social media and, and in the media, because of course the um, uh, presentation, representation of LGBT people, not in all countries, of course not, but in, in a significant number of countries has, has increased dramatically and shows more LGBT plus uh, people uh, on the screen. So I'm coming to the last question. Um, so what are the economic costs of LGBT plus representation in, 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 in uh, expressed and loss of GDP. That's interesting what you are, have put in here. So um, first in, uh, possible answer was 1.5% and about one third of your um, votes were saying, that's what you think. Then um, no loss at all was saying 8% uh, and about 5%. So the middle range was saying 63%. So well, that's also interesting. So this very um, huge um, uh, divergence here, uh, because it really depends. Uh, so there's research out now, for instance, by Open for Business. So this institution I've, I've mentioned already, uh, which says, for instance, uh, that you have for, for the English Caribbean states and in a loss of GDP between 2.5, the English speaking Caribbean state, between 2.1 and 5.7%. Uh, you have as well um, sort of research for, um, uh, for, 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 for others, let's say um, uh, uh, Uzbekistan or Poland or Hungary, and depending where you are, it's between 1% uh, and even more than uh, uh, these 5% I'm mentioning here. So it really depends. Uh, and what is, for instance, take another country, which is India. So there was a research, major research study out by Lee Batchett, 2014, which said it was 1.4% attributing to this loss um, of 1.4% of GDP attributed to this to um, more healthcare costs, uh, which of us are sustainable because of course there is more psychological um, um, uh, costs for the for, 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 for the system that is uh, underutilized human resources. 
and there is a loss of tourist dollars, etc. So thank you so much for participating here. So I'm coming to the last point. I think we have another um, uh, four to five minutes until we are getting to some uh, question session. So third point is ways to take action and ensure LGBT equality at work. So this topic addresses, and I'm, I'm trying to be sure here, and perhaps you can enter into discussion in this if you want. Um, so what can companies actually, so what are companies actually doing in ensuring LGBT, equality, LGBT plus equality at work? Um, uh, and what are they doing? So of course there's a broad range and of course we have as well different kinds of strategies. And of course we have as well the phenomena of pinkwashing. So then companies now pretending to be LGBT plus friendly in some countries, of course they don't do in China uh, uh, or in Bangladesh or in, uh, I don't know, Kyrgyzstan. Um, so where you have a very hostile climate for LGBT plus people, but let's say for, for, for those company, uh, countries where you would expect uh, a, a different climate, like the US, for instance, at least some part of the US, Canada, for instance, or Germany or France or Italy or the Netherlands, but also some parts in, in, in some other parts in Europe and, 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 or in, 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 in Asia, for instance, uh, so what what are, what are they doing? So usually um, one thing is um, there is somebody from the sea level speaking up to change the conversation. So in the past they may have not done anything, but in order to change something, it's very crucial that um, the employees in the company realize something has changed and this is supported from the top. So you need the support from the top and visibly in speeches in the intranet, but also, of course, in the activities um, beyond the corporate uh, uh, walls. So, uh, for instance, supporting NG NGOs uh, dealing with LGBT plus equality or um, participating in LGBT equality indexes um, or uh, supporting employees that has been that are working for, let's say, a company which is based in, let's say, the US, but then is sent to India or to Saudi Arabia. To what extent are they are able to and willing to protect these people? Or in Russia, I've been to Russia as well, of course, that's a different thing there, making telling a story as well about Russia in my book. Uh, so it really depends. So, so top level support is important. A strategy is important, of course. Then what is important very often as a first step as well to create an LGBT plus uh, employee network, ERG it's called, uh, employer research group, very often companies are, are, are calling this, uh, uh, and give them a budget and uh, empower them, make them visible. Um, also um, being visible, uh, uh, through uh, role models of these uh, members of this, uh, this network. Also um, initiating and promoting that allies are active in these LGBT uh, plus networks. Uh, for instance, when I was giving a presentation, I was invited to a major uh, technology conference of SAP. Uh, so I was invited by the women's network to give a presentation of my book. So there was a sort of uh, intersectional approach and allyship approach and understanding that's not enough that sort of um, the gender issue is addressed uh, in, in one box of the company while the LGBT plus equality uh, issue is addressed in another box. So that's sort of a growing pressure as well and a growing necessity to, things, to, think that these, uh, to, to think these things together and to work for these things um, uh, holistically. So there's a long list uh, which uh, you uh, can as well find in my book and you can as well ask for me that I think we are, are running out of time now. Perhaps I'm doing a last um, uh, point here, ways to take action, ensure LGBT equality at work. Again, I wanna take up this uh, thing of um, uh, uh, pinkwashing. So uh, the people own, so the companies or other organizations only pretend that they are LGBT plus friendly. 
When I'm asked, uh, what do you think I about pinkwashing comedy? Say, well, that's a good sign, which is perhaps a bit paradoxical, but uh, what I think is, some 10 years ago, we didn't, didn't even use or didn't know uh, this term of pinkwashing. So that there is now a complaint that companies are pinkwashing in certain areas of the world. As I said, of course, not in China or in, in Arabic states, but in, in other parts of the world, uh, that they are fee taking um, steps to, be po to position themselves as JDB friendly is a good sign. Why? Uh, because they know they have to do this to, to attract uh, talent, because they know uh, they have sensed it's important that so the customers are um, uh, raising, so are more aware and uh, putting more importance as well on companies uh, to show, uh, to, to, to position them as LGBT plus friendly as well. Investors are more sensitive to these issues because they know, they've learned, that's what research is showing, that um, uh, a, a corporate culture which is open and welcoming to everybody, independent of sexual orientation, gender identity, gender, uh, uh, race, ethnicity, um, age or whatever, so such a, um, working culture and corporate culture managed smartly is better for the economic outcome of a company. Uh, it's better as well for, uh, uh, for innovation because more perspectives are brought in, for growth, for profits. And of course, at the same time, it's not only good for business, but it's also good for, for, for human rights and, and, and ethical things which are more important uh, for, for the younger generation. So I think this is why I'm going to stop now. Excellent, thank you, gents. Um, obviously, thank you for presenting today. It's been fantastic to hear from you and obviously some really great takeaways and obviously um, some very insightful um, points which you, you made throughout the presentation. So um, we're gonna go to a short Q and A section uh, with the audience. Obviously, um, just before we do, just to remind everyone that if you do have any questions, uh, please type these into uh, the Q&A uh, feature or either the chat and obviously we'll try and get through all the, the questions and um, if we do run out of time don't worry these will get passed on to, to Jens to follow up with you um, following the webinar. Also just to let you know um, today's session has been recorded so you will receive a, um, a copy of the recording uh, a week from today so there'll be an email uh, sent to you which will have the, the exclusive link and obviously you can uh, watch the, the webinar back again. So um, we'll go to the Q&A section. So um, we've had some questions come in, Jen. So I think um, it'd be quite nice to start off. We've had a question around, um, obviously, someone wanting to make change in their organisation. So the question is, uh, what advice would you give to someone who wants to be a game changer in their organisation they work in? So, um, of course, the, the, the word game changer is a word play, of course, game changer. So I understand this question is now in the way that it's uh, how this person wants to know this, uh, wants to be a game changer with a why in there. So I'm making a difference in terms of um, LGBT equality at work. Correct me if I'm wrong, but I think this is understood that way. Yes. So, I think that's in this. Okay, so um, okay, that's that's a good question. It's a great question because it really depends, of course, on this the state of your company or your organization. So let's imagine, for instance, a company like uh, Accenture or SAP. So they are uh, very much or McKinsey or BCG uh, or Freshfield. So uh, so to, to mention a law firm as well. So those companies uh, are quite mature uh, in terms of um, edu sort of um, um, allowing or having realized so far a high degree of LGBT plus equality in work, which shows in, uh, in their policies, regulations, uh, the events they are setting up, the communications from the top and from the bottom. So uh, having ERGs, um, et cetera, et cetera. So of course, uh, to be a game changer there makes is different than uh, to be a game changer organization where you have a quite low level. And I now take this challenge on and assume that um, you, whoever has asked this question, 
are in an organization which has a low level of uh, LGBT friendliness. Well, uh, uh, so the first thing I think you do is uh, uh, form alliance behind the stage. Um, so you have to gather, uh, of course, people uh, of whom you think have the same sort of mindset as you have and you want to change something. But also, uh, and I've, I'm talking about some examples in my book as well, sometimes as well, you uh, 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 to have to take the risk and to expose yourself. What I mean is, uh, of course, it's uh, the first scenario is, of course, you're in a small group. Uh, you say, well, for instance, we want to, uh, you, uh, you go to your HR department or you go to, uh, to a, a major uh, guy uh, in your organization of whom you think who has an, has an impact. You so say, we want to form an LGBT plus uh, employee network. That's is, this is, um, uh, these are companies in our industry or another because we have these networks. These are the advantages, for instance, uh, talent acquirement, uh, acquisition arg arguments, cultural arguments, uh, economic arguments in the sense I've described, et cetera, et cetera. So make a list of arguments, uh, what are, so economic arguments. Uh, and then say, uh, so this is how we want to start. Um, and then think about, uh, for instance, uh, how can you set up your first event? For instance, I was invited in 2017 by Allianz Global Investors. So Allianz Global Investors is one of the major one, 20 top 25, 20, top uh, investing companies. And so um, they wanted to um, uh, launch their um, sort of um, uh, ERG and wanted to present what they have in mind and they invite the CEO. So I was there, invited there for a presentation and for a discussion, but also on the stage was then, uh, was then the CEO. Of course, to, uh, to become a game changer sometimes means as well to have to have a bit luck. So it was luck as well for the organization that they could manage that the CEO was uh, on stage. But usually uh, that's not that, that that's not that's not that improbable to um, to to uh, to to be lucky in that sense, because usually people tend to think only in their own bubble. And I strongly recommend to go beyond thinking beyond the LGBT plus bubble and to, uh, to form alliances with potential ally, allies. As I was saying, this is a growing importance in the corporate setting. So this is, these are some ideas uh, for, I hope this helps to answer this question. Yes, excellent, thank you, Jens. Uh, so we've had some more questions come in, so I'm gonna put this forward to you. So um, they're saying, we think that you covered it um, earlier on in, in the presentation, but they're asking um, about what, um, what are your expectations for the next years in the LGBT community in the economy field? Well, that's, um, well, uh, yeah, so I've covered this a bit, but in fact, I'm already thinking as well to perhaps set up a new book uh, uh, next year or so, early next year. Um, so I think that we are at a, uh, at a watershed moment, actually. Um, so, and we see, if we look at all our, at societies globally, not just because of the pandemic, but beyond that, that we have a sort of um, growing um, inequalities economic wise, education wise, health wise. So I think that we are now at a time of where not just diverse, but inclusion and managing inclusion and in a general sense matters more than ever. So for instance, the stakeholder approach I was referring to, so which sort of includes not just the investors money, but uh, all the interests of all the ones which are working in an organization, uh, so in a corporate world, is a major step uh, for moving forward for, for the company's world. And I think um, here is something as well you could do. I mean, everybody could do. If you're interested, not just to be a game changer in the way I've just described, but also uh, acknowledge that you as an individual have a, a certain power because you are belonging to the, to the younger cohort. I think this is something you can push as well through your activities, for instance, in social media. Uh, because corp the corporate worlds, um, they will have a lack of good talent. They already have. They will. This will increase um, uh, during the next the next years. And so the power of the young and the changed values compared to the older ones is increasing. So this is definitely something which I would say 
uh, will uh, determine the future path of LGBT equality also. So um, uh, yeah, I think I stop here. Excellent, fantastic. So we've got another question. Um, obviously, uh, the question is um, from the audience member. They work in quite a niche sector within the tech industry. So their question is that they are always looking for great talent within the diversity inclusion, with diversity and inclusion at the forefront of their hiring strategy. But how do they attract more LGBT plus people? Well, of course, this is a question related to, um, uh, I would say, um, uh, acquisition strategy, HR acquisition strategy. But uh, of course it goes, and I'm very, very thankful that this question is was put forward because of course, just to see it only as an HR strategy question uh, is not enough. Because we know if you go to a website uh, and see, go for instance, to a job fair or whatever, and you see, well, well, uh, if you're a member of the LGBT plus community or a member of whatever community, well, for me, it's important how this company deals with the LGBT plus community, because this is a real standard for me, whether they have an open and welcoming uh, uh, corporate culture. Of course, um, it's one thing, uh, that they perhaps position themselves on the website nicely with rainbow colors and uh, you know these um, kind buzzwords you always find on these websites and so forth. But I think uh, and that's the reason why I would say it's worthwhile then checking out as well these indexes and where uh, companies are uh, positioned at. Um, uh, so, uh, and that was because this question was coming from the tech industry, I think. Uh, of course, there are companies out that are strong in LGBT plus equality. Well, for instance, if you include SAP as a tech company, I would say that's a legitimate to do this. Or if you include uh, Accenture as a at least a tech loan and biased uh, company. Um, on the other hand, I, um, I have to say that if you look at, for instance, at companies like Google or Facebook or you know, social, usual suspects or Apple, interestingly, they are not that visible in the uh, discourse around LGBT plus equality, um, which does not mean that they're not open enough, but uh, it really means that they are perhaps not taking responsibility to the amount that it should be, to the extent that they should be. So, um, I would say, um, um, so focusing only at this question, only as a HR question is not enough. It really is something to do with the uh, holistic approach to DNI uh, and CSR uh, in general, and how um, the whole company as such is presenting itself vis-a-vis -vis all the stakeholders I've mentioned before. Sorry, it's a bit complicated. It's not, not an easy, or easy question, but it's also not an easy answer. No, that's perfect, excellent. Um, I'm gonna put forward one last question because I think it's quite a nice question to obviously finish on. So, um, so from your research um, from the book, uh, what organizations did you find were leading the way in diversity and inclusion? And why do you think this is the case? So may I ask, uh, Paul, is this DNI or is this LGBT DNI? Um, LGBT. Okay. Okay, which organizations? So perhaps you should differentiate between, uh, on the one hand, those um, organizations I've mentioned in the first part of my presentation of the webinar. So for instance, um, uh, Product Work Foundation in Germany or um, uh, uh, RISE in India or uh, uh, really in Spain or Stormer in the UK or Out Leadership in uh, the US or Open for Business in the UK. Of course, all these organizations are very important for, because here you see something which is as well new, something something new which has developed over the, during the last 10 years. Of course, the, the companies that are working in these organizations under the, the umbrella of these organizations are on the one hand competitors on the job market, on the, on the money market, the investment market, and the customer market, et cetera, et cetera. On the other hand, they, they have understood that it's important to join forces and to move this topic forward. So gather forces, if, I say, if, if you want. So in a way, these organizations are leading the way in some way. If you look at the corporate and at individual um, uh, companies, I recommend to you 
basically as well to look at the respective indexes in the respective countries. Why I'm saying this, uh, for instance, if you go to the major index of the human rights campaign in the US, of course, that's a very important one. But if you see that there are sometimes companies in there, for instance, EY, um, an example, and I, I think they have a right, the highest rating there, but they don't have high ratings in other countries. So it really depends, uh, oh, typically French companies. So I, I speak French, I've been living many years in the French speaking part of Switzerland. I'm very much interested in France as well. I'm, I'm, you know, I'm German, but nevertheless, I'm, 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 I've lived in many places. So uh, in, in France, um, you see very many companies as well being present in the HR um, human rights campaign index covering most, mostly the US, are they, although the, the index is also focusing on what the companies are doing globally. But if you go then to France, many of these companies are not present there uh, because it's uh, the uh, French landscape and push, moving on with LGBT equality in the workplace is more challenging for cultural reasons than in the US. So as I said, so it's a great question, but it really depends on the cultural setting you are in. And uh, you have to watch carefully in which country you're, lo which country you're looking and where, where the company is uh, is active. Excellent, fantastic. Um, unfortunately, we seem to be out of time. Um, so just thank you for taking the time to present today. It's been fantastic to have you. And obviously, it's been great hearing all your insights. Um, and I'm sure the audience have uh, thoroughly enjoyed it as well. Um, just before we do go, uh, just to remind the audience that a week from today, you will receive an email, uh, which will have the link uh, for the recording. So. Um, have a keep a look out for that email. Um, our next webinar is taking place on the 23rd of February. Uh, that's with Stephen D'Souza and he'll be presenting on not knowing, leading in uncertainty. So to, to join that webinar, just head over to our website. Uh, you'll be able to fill out the form to register your place. And uh, obviously we'll be in touch uh, nearer the time with obviously the login details. So lastly, thank you again, Jens. It's been great to have you. And uh, we look forward to seeing everyone at a webinar in the near future. Thank you. Thank you.